pick up now, after Easter, back in the book of Acts, the transforming power of the gospel. The, the Bible is the tale of transformation, but in particular, this part of Acts, we see these repeated stories of individuals, groups, and cultures being transformed by the gospel. And that's where we kind of want to jump back into tonight. Will you bow with me before we proceed? Father, now as we come to your word, we ask that you would just settle our hearts. Open our minds and our hearts to your word as you open it to us. Speak to us, we pray, Jesus, you who are the living word. Amen. So I want to remind you of something in case uh, you've forgotten or haven't been with us, that the book of Acts is a, somewhat unique among some of the, the, the uh, New Testament books in that it's an account, and there are lots of accounts, but it's a defense, if you will. It's a case for Christ and the Christian message. Actually, it's the sequel. It's part two of Luke's uh, account or defense of Christianity to a man named Theophilus. The first part is about who Jesus was, what he did, and that's significance. And the second part is about what his followers did after his death, resurrection, and ascension. That's where we are, the book of Acts. And so the things that are written are building a case, are proving a point. They're giving an account for a reason, for a purpose, to validate, to compel us with the person and the message of Jesus Christ. I was born in 1970. That makes me old to some of you and young to others. I'm part of what's called Generation X, those who study generations, uh, Generation X. The students that I mentioned that I used to work with are part of Generation Y, or millennials now we call them. I think Y was a, a term they used just very, very briefly. Uh, there's big business in studying generations. Um, for a while, when I was in youth ministry, they called it the postmodern shift. That it was, and they don't have a name for it. They called it postmodern because it comes after the modern. And I don't even know what we're in now, but we're in an era where the millennial people studying this generation... Are, it's um, in secular businesses and all over the map are studying the generations and the trends and what makes them tick and how we are to reach them, whether that's for Christian purposes or not. Um, one of the things that marks the generation that we see emerging now and in our culture in general, we live in a culture marked by relativism and pluralism. In case you wonder about those isms, pluralism means there are lots of options, it's particularly, particularly when it comes to faith. Pluralism meaning there's no, not only one thing you have to believe, there are lots of options. A plurality of beliefs. And relativism meaning that we no longer really want to know which one of these many options is true. We don't even ask you that question, which one of these options works or is relevant in my life. That's different than the previous generation, the generation of many of you. The one word catchphrase, whatever, my kids use that all the time, it's an expression of this concept. Choices based on feeling over intellect. More and more in our culture, people have stopped asking the question, what's true? It's not a relevant question to them, so they think. So how are we as a church then to bring the, the unchanging eternal truth of the gospel into a culture that's not really asking that question? Not really asking what's true anymore. At least not the same way as previous generations asked the question. And that's where we find ourselves in the book of Acts, chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts 17. And if not, it'll be on the giant screens. You can follow along with me as I read Acts 17, beginning with verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined and allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and, yet, and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. It's an amazing story. We literally could spend a month's worth of sermons and not even come close to plumbing the depths of all that's contained in these verses. And I hope that you'll have a chance to reflect on that on your own. Um, Paul, this is happening in Athens. Paul, uh, we have no indication that he intended to stay there. He's waiting for his companions. And um, as he's with Silas and Timothy, and as he's waiting for them, he has time to sort of tour the city, just to walk around. When we were in Jerusalem, uh, Pastor Brian and I, we were busy every day seeing different sites. And what I really wanted to do was just go out and walk around the old city without an agenda. So at night, I would do that if I wasn't too tired. Just walk around and observe, watch people, look at, just observe the city and its life. That's kind of what Paul's doing here. He doesn't really have an agenda. He's just in Athens waiting for his friends, and he's watching what's going on, and he's observing things. Athens, by the way, was no longer the dominant military power it once was in, in the time of the Greek city-states, but it was, it, Rome had conquered, of course, the region, and Rome was the military power, but Athens, at this time in history, was still the primary intellectual and cultural center of the Greco-Roman world. That hadn't yet shifted to Rome. Athens was still the center of art, culture, literature, philosophy, and new ideas. So Paul's in a pretty exciting place to be. And as Paul's there, looking around at the city, he's observing things, and he sees altars, temples, idols everywhere. The city is littered with them. And as he's there he begins to talk about the gospel in what's called the Agora, translated marketplace here. It's a little bit of a bad English translation. It doesn't mean shopping center like you're thinking. It's not the mall in, in first century Athens. It was, you know, there, there, were no, there was no internet, there was no television, there was no publications, uh, circulation, periodicals. There was just this one centerpiece of town that was the place for everything. Art, literature, philosophy, people sharing ideas, People, it was the financial center, it was the financial district, it was the cultural center, the cultural district. It was the, everything that was going on was going on in the Agora. Paul's there, and he begins to talk about the gospel. Over a couple of days, it seems, at least. And in that time, he draws the, the attention of a group of philosophers. First thing we see right here, we've already talked about, is the cultural power of the gospel. The power of the gospel in a particular culture. Now, while he's there, Epicureans and Stoics are, are drawn to him. The next slide I think you'll see here is the city of Athens. This is off the internet. We didn't go there. That's a good picture. So down below, you, see, you can see that row of pillars just above the tree line down at the bottom of the, of the city ruins. Archaeologists think that's the Agora. That was the city market. And it went almost all the way, three-quarters of the way around the city. That's where things were going on, the center, the heartbeat of the city. At the top of the hill is the Acropolis there, and that's where the Areopagus met. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you get a sense for where Paul was. Now, while he's there, um, the philosophers of the day, Epicureans and Stoics, you'll see them on the screen here, I believe. Um, Epicureans and Stoics were the primary schools of philosophy at that time. Uh, Epicureans believed that the goal of human life was seeking pleasure, that seeking uh, personal pleasure was what you should be after. Stoics believed in 
uh, they were pantheists, as most were. They believed the goal of life was to live in harmony with the determined universe. Whatever came your way, to accept it as fated, as predetermined, and not to get too upset, too high or too low, but to live in a balanced, harmonious state with whatever happened. Stoicism, right? A stoic, stiff upper lip. We get that idea from the Stoic philosophies. They've been corrupted down through the centuries, but there's a lot of people still that are, we could call Epicureans and Stoics today. Those seeking pleasure and those trying just to accept whatever comes and, and just take it as it comes. These are the primary philosophies, and they're curious about what Paul is saying. And one of the things I want to point out here is Paul sees, when he's in Athens, look with me for a minute here at the text. Uh, in verse 16, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. Some of your translations might say greatly distressed. The word in Greek literally means pulled and up, pulled in two opposing directions, pulled apart, if you will. It's pull, tearing me apart. I'm, I'm pulled in opposite directions by, over what he saw. I just want to pause for a minute and ask you a question. In our culture, the culture you live in and I live in, what greatly distresses you? What provokes your spirit and your heart? What makes you feel like you're being pulled in opposite directions? What breaks you? We talk a lot, or you hear a lot of talk about culture wars. People get very upset about how this particular vote goes, what the, what the federal government is or is not doing, or the state government is or isn't doing. And I'm not saying we should be politically active. We should. But regardless of your political ideologies... When's the last time your heart was broken over people worshiping the wrong things? Not over what legislation is coming down the pike. And I, I'm convicted about this too. When's the last time you were, were greatly distressed, on the verge of tears even, felt like your heart was being torn in two over people in our culture who don't know Jesus, who are worshiping false gods, that's the picture we have of Paul, and it quite literally reflects Christ's heart in that. I've got to check on my own spirit. Maybe you should do the same thing. Go down the list. Politics, sports, the stock market. If those things cause you more emotion, more pain, more angst than those who don't know Jesus, well, you might want to think about that, and so might I. So Paul starts talking. He can't help himself. He doesn't plan to. He's not there as a missionary. Move. He just, he's not, it, it, we have no indication he planned to do this. He's just there waiting, there observing, and he's so moved he can't not talk about it. He can't help himself. And he does this for a couple of days. So the Greek authorities begin to hear about this guy. They're curious, and Athens was known for new ideas. And so they drag him off to a place called the Areopagus. Uh, count of 50 Greek senators in the Areopagus and philosophers a kind of philosophic review board, if you will, for what was going on in the city. He's somewhat on trial, but not really, not criminal trial, but they're, they're, they're interrogating him to, about these ideas. They meet at a place called Mars Hill or the Acropolis. You saw it there in the picture. And these philosophers seem slightly annoyed, but also curious about these strange ideas. Talk was cheap in Athens, verse 21 of the text. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Interesting, right? It reminds me of sports talk radio, which I have on speed dial on my car. AM670, all sports all day. Just guys who probably never played talking about what professional athletes should or should not do. And I love it. I can't stop listening to it. It is totally pointless. I saw someone tweet the other day. It said, the reason I love professional sports is I really enjoy getting stressed out about things I cannot control. It's perfect, isn't it? Or perhaps uh, just, just you know, talk radio in general or talk shows in general. I hate to mention it in church, but there was a horrible show once on called The View. Without apologies to those of you who loved it, you should confess that. <laughs> just people expressing opinions, sometimes uneducated, totally unfounded, just expressing opinions. Athens is full of people who have new ideas and new opinions, bringing pieces of here and there together and concocting new philosophies, and that's what went on, and that was, the, that was hot topic stuff. Now, interestingly, they call Paul a babbler. You notice this? What is this babbler saying, they say? Babbler uh, comes from the Greek word. It means to be a seed picker. The, it was a pejorative term. 
They're saying one who just picks at seeds, picks at little bits of information without having any real thoughts of his own. That's, that's what they're saying about Paul, some of them anyway. What a challenge Paul had. What an opportunity Paul had. So they don't bring him there because they're excited. They don't bring him to the Areopagus because this is, we've got to hear this. This is amazing. This is life-changing stuff. They bring him there because it's curious. They'll either be interested intellectually or they can, you know, make sport of him. But he has an opportunity. Let's read verses 22 and 23. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the object of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. This might be the most brilliant beginning for a, the gospel in a particular culture contained in these pages. Paul begins right where they were. He doesn't condemn them or tell them they're wrong. You notice, he doesn't begin by telling them how wrong they are. He begins actually by sort of complimenting them. I noticed something about you. You're extremely religious. Today, perhaps, you would say, you Americans, North Americans, are very spiritual. You're interested in spiritual things. You can be religious about anything. You can be religious about working out, which I'm clearly not, but you could be. You can be religious about your diet. You can be religious about your sports team. You can be religiously engaged in lots of things. Spiritually interested in spiritual things, to have a curiosity. Paul begins where they are, and he says uh, this idea. Oh, by the way, this, this temple of the unknown God, you might be wondering, like, why would they do that? Did they run out of names, or what was the, the point of that? Uh, historians tell us that um, in a, a couple centuries before the time of Paul, uh, Greek philosopher Epimenides writes about a, a, a severe um, plague in the city. And that it was, it was sort of, uh, they couldn't figure out the pattern. It was randomly uh, affecting people in different parts of the city. People were dying um, in droves. And so this philosopher, scholar, city leader, Epimenides, uh, came up with this idea. They would let loose groups of sheep, mostly white but a few black. And when the sheep laid down, wherever the sh a black sheep laid down, they should build an altar there to an unknown god and sacrifice the sheep there to him to hopefully assuage the gods and defeat the plague. So you have throughout the city for centuries these little altars to unknown gods. Just want to cover all our bases, right? In case we missed one. This is Paul's starting point. Let me tell you about this God. Because what's going on there? People are worshiping. Try, it, that, 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 an altar to an unknown God is saying something about this culture, right? We don't want to miss. We know that there's something beyond us. We know there are gods in control. And we, and, and we want to make sure we cover all of them. We want to seek all of them. But Paul doesn't begin by telling him how wrong they are. He says, let me tell you about this God you don't know yet. That's his starting point, verses 24 to 31. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined in a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us. The very first thing Paul does is to set this God, his God, our God, the God of the Bible, apart from all other gods. You notice that? He says, this God that you worship as unknown is not like any of the other gods that you actually have names for. He's totally unlike them. He does not live in temples made by human hands. He's not, you can't fashion an image of him. He's unlike anything you've yet experienced. This brings us to the intellectual power of the gospel. God is not the maid, he is the maker. God is who he is, the creator of all that exists. He cannot be made or invented or altered by those he has created. Let me pause here and ask another question. How are you trying to make God? You might be saying, well, that's ridiculous. I don't have idols. I don't make idols. When I was in Jerusalem again, you walk in the old city, if any of you have been there, you know how narrow those streets are, and there's shops just crowded with things. And you go to some of these churches, and there are icons, or idols, there's a slippery slope between them, galore, for sale, relics, objects of worship, veneration, all over the city. We would say, well, we don't live in that culture, I'm not, I don't cover my house in idols. But before you answer that you're not trying to make God, let me just press on that a little bit further. 
in the, his book, Habits of the Heart, if any of you read that book, you know that there, there's a, it's, a, it's a cultural study of the religious tendencies and spiritual appetites of, our, of North American culture. One particular, uh, it, it, ta- it examines all kinds of religions, particularly fascinated with the personal religions that, are, that, that don't get uh, g- groups of followers. Sheila Larson, a young nurse who has received a good deal of therapy and describes her faith as Sheilaism. This suggests the logical possibility of more than 400 million American religions, one for each of us. I believe in God, Sheila says. I'm not a religious fanatic. No- notice there that anytime somebody says the word religious fanatic in our culture, what is that? A good term or bad? It's bad, right? Don't get too out of control. That's where things get, you know, that's where evil stuff happens. Keep it in perspective. Keep it under control. Let's not be fanatics about anything religious. She says, I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. I call it Sheilaism. Just my own inner voice. Sheila's faith has some tenets beyond belief in God, though not many. In defining what she calls my own Sheilaism, she says... It's just try to love yourself. Be gentle with yourself. You know, I guess, take care of each other. I think God would want us to take care of each other. Like many others, Sheila would be willing to endorse few more specific points than these. Now, I'm not disagreeing that we should take care of each other and learn to love each other. But she's got a God of her own making, hasn't she? Sheilaism. No, no one's going to become a martyr for Sheilaism. No one's going to sacrifice financially, give their whole life, sacrifice friendships even if it was necessary for Sheilaism. But there is a level of comfort and control and security that comes from creating your own religion or your own idea of God. Now, we may not, you may not be making idols and putting them in your home to worship, and you may not be naming your own faith after yourself, at least I hope not. But I think we should be careful that we're all not subtly trying to fashion God into something he's not. If our God is just only that which we devote, let me put it this way, if if God is in your life, if the Lord of your life is what I'm saying, the one you devote most of your mental energy to, what you give most of your finances toward, what you spend most of your time in, then is it the God of the Bible? If what you worship, the Lord of your life, is what you daydream about, where your your mind goes, where your heart is turned toward, what you care most about, as evidenced by your time and your treasure, is it the God of the Bible? To the Athenians, Paul said, you can't make God out of gold or silver. To us, I think he would say, you cannot make God out of your own desires or wishes. The second thing Paul explains about God is that not only is he creator of us all, but he's also deeply involved in his creation. He cares about his creation. He's present with his creation. The Stoics believed in fate. Whatever will be, will be. Our job is to accept it. That's how you live in harmony. Epicureans believed in a sort of vague, distant gods who were only marginally involved. It was up to us to seek our good and our pleasure. Paul is introducing them to a God who is intimately involved with his people. Not a fatalistic determining God who wound up the the universe and lets it go. Not a God who's uninvolved or disinterested, and it's up to you to figure out your life. A God who's deeply involved with his creation. Verse 26 of the same text. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined and allotted the periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek him and perhaps feel their way toward him. He puts you where you are. He cares about your situation. It's not an accident that you live where you live, that you are in the circumstances you're in. God cares about those things. He's involved in those things. I remember Noah, who's an 18-year-old senior in high school, has a bad case of senioritis. He's going to be leaving home in a few, a little over a month. Hard to believe. But I remember when he was a little guy, we would take vacations up to the, 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 uh, Michigan and, and spend time on the beach in the summers, and he, we loved to make sandcastles. We tried to make them bigger than better than anybody else on the beach. That's, I know that's a little bit sick in the competitive nature of our family, but we would do that. And so Noah would uh, bring all of his little figures, 
all, carry him in little cases, little, little army men and little superhero figures in his trucks and stuff, and he would you know, have in his mind, even before we ever got to where we're going in Michigan, how they would all be in the sandcastle. He'd have in his little brain exactly how it should look. Now, he couldn't always create it. That's where Dad came in, and I would make what he told me to make. And he'd put his little, if you move one of them, no, 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 it has to, he has to go there. He had in his mind where it's all supposed to be. He pictured it. There's a sense in which God has placed you where you are. I think the myth in our culture is, I determine my destiny. The decisions I've made have led me to this point. There's some truth in that. But it's up to me. I'm making my life. No, you're not. God put you there. At best, we could probably say the good things that have happened in my life have been by his grace. And things that have been not so good have often been because of my choices apart from his will. Paul says, God created all people. He placed them where they are. Why? Verse 27. So that they would seek him and feel their way toward him and find him. What does that mean? God puts you where you are so that not only would you seek him, but those around you would seek him. Do you hear that? God made you and placed you where you are for a purpose. So that you and those you come in contact with would seek God would find him, would long to know him. That means tonight, if you're here and you know him, he's put you where you are to help others know him. And if you're here tonight and you don't know him, he's put you here so you would. He's not a God that's far off and distant, fatalistic in determining things, or uninvolved. God has designed us to seek for him. One of my favorite poems is the poem by George Herbert. I found out about George Herbert because C.S. Lewis writes about Herbert. Uh, he is most nutritious. Nutritious. I didn't know who Herbert was, so I went and looked him up, and I found, I, I began to really love his, I'm not much of a poet, but I loved his poetry. He has a poem called The Pulley. It's oddly named, but it means what's pulling us toward him. And I did not plan to share it tonight, so I didn't write it down. So I'm going to try to recite it to you. If it's bad, you'll just forgive me, and we'll erase the recording. I'm only kidding. He says, uh, Herbert says, when God at first made man, having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches which dispersed lie contract into a span. So God poured out, and wisdom first made a way. Then strength, honor, pleasure flowed. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, Bestow this jewel also on my creature. He should rest in nature, not the God of nature, and both should so both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep it with repining restlessness. That if goodness lead him not, weariness would toss him to my breast. A former professor of mine says, you don't get the magic of a poem unless you recite it five times out loud slowly. We don't have time for that tonight. Do you get the imagery, though? God making man and woman, mankind, pouring out his blessings on our lives. Wisdom, strength, creativity, honor, pleasure. But he holds one thing back in the bottom of the glass, rest. So that even if goodness leads, doesn't lead us to seek him, our restlessness would. What does Ecclesiastes 3.11 say? God has placed eternity in the hearts of men, but we have not understood what he's done from beginning to end. He's made us to seek him. Augustine famously said in his confessions, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, but our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. We're made to look for him. We're made to seek him. Paul says, God puts you where you are as part of that, to seek after him and to help others do the same. There is no doubt a growing spiritual hunger in our world today. You've noticed it. You see it all around. I recently heard uh, or read uh, an author who talked about, and I've used this in the past, he talked about American spirituality as smorgasbord spirituality. Buffet tables. Who doesn't love a good buffet? I mean, everyone, I love buffets. Who doesn't love buffets? We had buffets every night in our hotel in Israel. I miss those, to be honest with you. I've heard that on a cruise, it's buffets all the time. Someday I'll go on a cruise, if for no other reason than for that reason. But if you think about it, what do you do in a buffet, right? You walk down the line with your plate. No thank you. Yes, please. No thank you. Beets. You know, no thank you. Chocolate cake. I'll have more of that. You just, you take what you want. And you refuse the things you don't want. It's up to you. Now let's apply that to spirituality. Some people approach religion in our culture. Seeking after truth, whatever it might be. 
Like the buffet line, right? Grace and peace, yes, I'll have seconds of that, please. Oh, personal sacrifice? No, thank you. I'm not, uh, I doesn't agree with me, right? Move on down the line, you know? Oh, love for your neighbor? Yes, please, I'll have some of that. Oh, a confession of sin? You know, no thanks, I'm full. You know, you just you make your own. You laugh, but we do it in our own church sometimes. This attitude about faith and spirituality has crept in even among those who call ourselves Christians. Love and mercy of Jesus, yes. Oh, the sexual ethic the Bible talks about? I'm not so sure. That doesn't seem culturally acceptable today. Power in my work? I, yeah, I want some of that. I want to be successful. I think this kind of smorgasbord spirituality cannot and will not satisfy the deepest longings of our life. This brings us finally to the personal power of the gospel, and we don't, we'll finish here. I have a relatively new friend I met just a few weeks ago before Easter, actually, before we left for Israel. He sought me out. He knows somebody that I know in our community, and he said to me, my life's not working. It's a curious phrase. We got together for coffee before I left, and I promised to get together with him afterwards, and so next week we're going to meet, meet again. I want to know what he means by not working. He says things like, struggling financially, marriage isn't good, things aren't good at home, uh, my kids, are, it's, we're not getting along, we're going to sit down together. I know he's looking for solutions to those particular issues, but I'm going to, have a ch I'm going to get the chance to tell him about this unknown God, the God that he does not yet know, who wants to come into his life not to fix all of his problems, but to redeem him, to forgive his sin, to reconcile his heart to heaven, to have a relationship with him. Friend also asked lots of questions. He said things like, you know, I, I've met lots of Christians who are hypocritical, so I don't go to church. I don't understand how terrible things happen to good people and how God can be loving, so, and I'm not ready to accept all the, the Christianity. He's got all these, many of the same objections some of you have had or certainly have heard about. And I'm going to talk to him about Easter resurrection message when we meet. Because here's the thing, friends, for all of us. I said this last week at the East Campus, but I'll say it again. If, if, if the resurrection is not true, what does Paul say here? As, as evidence or proof of his argument, he says in verse, 32, or verse 31, he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance, proof in other words, to all by raising him from the dead. In verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, well, we'll hear more about this later. In other words, when Paul got to the resurrection, that was the dividing line. That was the moment of truth. Some people believed, a few, not many. Many mocked him, dismissed him. Some said, well, well let's talk more later, right, keeping it at arm's length. But when he got to the resurrection, that's when the, whole, the penny dropped. They're curious, they're interested, they want to know until that moment. And that's still the truth today. What we talked about last week is still the turning point for all of us. Because if Jesus Christ has not been raised, then he's not worth worshiping, he's not worth following, he might be a historical curiosity, but he's not worth much of anything. But if he has, then it does not matter if you can't reconcile why bad things happen to good people. It does not matter if you've met some Christian hypocrites. Welcome to the club. There's a few here tonight, I'm sure. It does not matter if you've had bad experiences in church. Because if he's been raised from the dead, then he is who he said he was, the God of the universe. And he has rightful claim over your heart and of mine. And you've got to deal with that. You dismiss it or ignore it to your peril. That's what Paul's saying. Let me tell you about this God that you long to know, even though you don't even know you're searching for him. He made you to look for him. He put me here as no accident. Paul thought he's waiting for his friends. Turns out he's there to tell the Athenians about the love of Christ. Who do you know that's searching for God? Who in your life do you know? And maybe they don't even know it yet, but you can see it. You know. How do you know that God didn't put you in proximity to them? To reveal the love of the living Lord. To tell them about a God they don't know, but who longs to know them. The power of the gospel, friends, is powerful to change culture, not by affecting elections necessarily, but by transforming the hearts of the people who live in it. The power of the gospel can transform our minds intellectually, how we think and see the world. But most importantly, it transforms hearts, personally. 
Let's pray together. Father, we worship you tonight, and we're so grateful that you have risen, you do reign, and you will return. For those here tonight who know this truth but sometimes live, live without it in full view, pray by the, your grace and your love you would remind them that you made them, you placed them where they are for a reason, to seek you and to help others do the same. For those here tonight, Lord, who do not know you, Maybe they're waking up to that reality for the first time. Lord, by your spirit, even now, prick their hearts and draw them into the love that only you can give. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.